First Peter chapter 2 has the word therefore in it in two consecutive verses. That's really uh, weird. It's like saying in conclusion, and then a preacher talks another 15 minutes and says in conclusion. I'm glad that you've got these two verses in two verses, and, uh, or these two uh, words begin with the same word therefore, because therefore is a, is a summation. So what I want us to do tonight is to focus on the, on the things that are found in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verses 6 through 8. I want to look at that text. It's, it'll be on the screen in just a minute. And, uh, and just look at it. Open up your Bible. It might be that you choose to, uh, uh, to, to place uh, notes there in relationship to it. As you look at this passage, in the verses that David discussed in the, in the, the previous study of this, he talked about us being a living stone that we are the temple of God and we are, we are lively stones. We talked in that lesson this morning about that uh, temple that was overlaid with gold and how easy it would be to glorify the gold and the very nature of something that was ornately beautiful and was in one sense, had there been eight wonders of the world, it would have been the eighth wonder of the world, just overlaid with gold and all of the splendor that it had. And then to imagine how easy that all of that goal that was there would destroy spirituality. But we struggle with the same thing, I think, sometimes. God blesses us with material things, and uh, He's blessed us like He said He would. He'd, he'd make us prosper, and, and, and so many have good jobs, and so many are doing well, and then all of a sudden the very blessings of God become a curse in our lives. And so it was with that temple. And thus God destroyed that temple that God had built. God had ordained that priesthood. God had ordained that altar. God had ordained that holy place. And he told the people, this is where you meet God. And for some pagan God to come in and destroy that and do away with the temple of the holy place and the most holy place without God being a part of it would just mean that, that God is an inferior God. But God said, listen, we're going to take care of this because the signs given in Matthew chapter 24 about the destruction of that temple, remember, not one stone will be left upon another. And here's the signs that will precede it. And if you'll look carefully at verse 14, the Bible says, or pardon me, of, of Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, he says that this gospel about what I'm talking about will be preached in all the world. It's not just the gospel but this good news that God's going to do away with this temple. And every Gentile on earth ought to rejoice. Can you imagine being outside the framework of the commonwealth of Israel? But what, what is put in its place? And what is put in its place is the temple of the New Testament. And that's what we were trying to talk about in that lesson this morning, about here's that Levitical priesthood. Aren't you glad that we don't have to go that we can just worship God anytime, any way we want to. That we can go and offer the sacrifice and the praise of our lips to God anytime we want to. We can praise Him in our prayers anytime we want to. Imagine in that Old Testament system. You're guilty of sin, and the only way you can get rid of your sin is to go down to that temple, and a Levite has to offer your sacrifice. Aren't you glad that as a child of God that you are a priest and you can say, God, forgive me. I'm your child. Please forgive me. I made so many mistakes. I'm turning my life around. God, just forgive me about all those mistakes that I've made. And so that's why Peter talks about this living, a, a living temple. And, and, uh, and, and this, this is not the only time that Peter will discuss this. But in the verses that precede the verses we're going to look at, look at that word lively stones. Not some stone like the stones in that temple, some of them weighing 20 tons. Uh, there's one report that some of them might have weighed 40 tons. You know how much that is? Isn't 40 tons 80,000 pounds? You stop and think about uh, the weight of one of those stones and, and how it would just sit there and wouldn't do anything. And so Peter talks about we are living stones. We are a living temple. And the temple of God is holy and that is us. But how does Jesus fit into this picture? And so that's why when you, when you get down to verse 6, Therefore it is contained in the Scriptures, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, 
And he who who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Before we look at everything that's involved in this, what do you think of when you think of a cornerstone? We've used that word. It's a very common word in, in, uh, in our language. I don't believe this building has a cornerstone, does it? I, I remember West Huntsville, the, car, the building that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, I grew up in after they tore down the wooden frame building. We built that, built, that uh, brick building. Uh, they built that in 1945-46. On the cornerstone, I hated it because they lied. They put the date, they bricked the building there, and it used to bother me no end. I was worshiping this building in 1946 and on the cornerstone. That'll, you know what I'm talking about, embedded in the bricks? Cornerstone. Make governors of, uh, pardon me, mayors of cities and uh, city commissioners oftentimes will put a plaque on some building. That's not a Bible cornerstone. Can I tell you what a Bible cornerstone is? Don't look at me. I want you to look right up at that chandelier, right? You've got to look up straight, right up there in the middle. And you, see, you see where that center ch- ch- chandelier comes from? Uh, uh, Clayton, you're going to have to turn your neck more than that. That, 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 that. that one right back there. That's what a cornerstone is. Now, that's not what we call it in our day. But if you can imagine building a building in ancient times, there was a, a, a stone that was called a cornerstone in the Old Testament, it's called the cap stone. If you can see how that stone, that center part of where that chandelier is attached, it caps this building. And so in ancient times, they'd build a building and they'd, build, they'd put four walls in it. And, before, and then they'd have to some way get the roof to be there. Otherwise, you've got a building, it's got walls, it doesn't have a roof. And so they would frame their building somewhat like ours are framed in these uh, pieces of wood that are, that are pieces of, uh, uh, of metal that are covered with wood. And, and they, or maybe they're, maybe they're all wood, I've forgotten. And, and, uh, and you'd run them from the four corners. Well, what's going to hold those corners together? You know what would hold those corners together? That cornerstone, that capstone. And if you don't have that capstone up there, you've got all of these beams going up there, and they are useless. Nothing to hold them in place. And that's why Peter calls Jesus the cornerstone. Not that little plaque that's put somewhere in a building that is, that is meaningless, but that which brings all four of the walls together. And in this building, there are eight beams, in case you're trying to count, wondering uh, where they all come from. There are eight beams that come, and they're all tied together. And that's what ties it together. Now, Jesus is the foundation. Other foundation can no man lay. He's the foundation of the house of God. But in this imagery, He is that which brings it all together. And then He says, Therefore, to you who believe, He's precious. That's in verse 7. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Who's the cornerstone? That's Jesus. And He has become the most important part of this temple that God has. And then He says, in reference to this this stone that, that was the chief cornerstone, The chief cornerstone was also a stone they stumbled over. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumbled, being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. I want us tonight, as we develop this lesson, to recognize that you have the end of the Jewish temple, you have the beginning of the new one, but there are two views of this cornerstone. And every person on this earth that is exposed to Jesus in any way has got to decide that He is the chief. He's the chief cornerstone. He's the focal point of everything that God is going to do, on, has done on this earth or ever will do on this earth. He is the chief cornerstone. But if He's not that, He becomes the rock over which people stumble. So let's look at this. Let's look at the way believers look at this cornerstone. That's what Peter does. 
Let's look at the, the way the builders look at, or pardon me, the, those who believe in the Lord look at this cornerstone. And then let's look at the, at the way those who are unbelievers look at the chief cornerstone. Think about the vulgarity that sometimes involves the name of Jesus. I know that more frequently in our day, the, the name of God is more often blasphemed than the name of Jesus. But there was that time whenever the name, the expression Jesus Christ was just like, oh my God, it's part of our society. And every now and then you'll hear that. People who bought it, by the way, to soften that up, wouldn't say Jesus Christ. Nice people didn't say Jesus Christ, they said G. And nice people wouldn't say God, so they said gosh. And nice people wouldn't say damn, so they said darn. You know, nice people don't want to curse. We're just, we just do it, just use a little bit different words. But you see, Jesus becomes a stumbling block. And if a man's never heard of Jesus, he may not be a stumbling block. He stumbles, obviously, because he denies there is a God and that he denies that the heavens declare the glory of God. And the Bible says that man's a fool who does that. But when you are exposed to Jesus, by the very fact that you know Jesus lived on this earth, you have got to make a decision. And what does Peter say about it? Well, look back where he says in verse 6, Therefore is it contained in the Scripture, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. He is elect. What does that mean? You stop and think of all that God has ever done. If you had to pick the guy who'd, put, who'd stand right in the middle of the podium, if you'd had to pick the man that is the most prominent, the most important uh, thing that God has ever done on this earth, that's who Jesus is. But he's not just that in the plan of God. He's that in our life, isn't he? Think of how many songs we sing in which we sing about the love that we have of Jesus. Think about the songs that we sing, Christ, we do all adore thee. Think about the attitude that we have toward Jesus. To us, He's the focus of God's plan and He's the focus of our life. He is the elect one. But not only is He, is he that, you look at Him and Peter says in that very same verse, He is elect, that's in verse 6, and He is precious. Think about how precious Jesus is to you. I don't know where I would have been had I lived in the first century. There's a song that David has taught us, and we've sung it here in this auditorium several times about the fact that I hear my voice among the scoffers whenever he's hanging on the cross. I don't know if you pay attention to the words of that song, but I find as we sing that song, I hear my voice that's among the scoffers that are glad he's being put to death. And there were those people that rejoiced. In fact, Jesus said, there are those who, who, uh, who will persecute you thinking they are doing the will of God. And they, the charge they brought against Jesus was, was in defense, at least in the, on that one or two occasions, was in defense whenever they said, he's a blasphemer. Whenever he says, I'm the son of God, he's a blasphemer, let's put him to death. The very thing that he was, the very thing that he claimed to be. You know what he is to us? Do you know how precious it is? I don't know who you think of when you quote the 23rd Psalm. It may be because of paintings that we've seen, that uh, the, manifest, the visual picture we got of that. But if we talk about the good shepherd, it, that's who Jesus depicts himself. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. You know how precious that is? You know how precious the words of Jesus are? I go and I prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You know how precious that is? How about the, what about those words of Jesus spoken to the apostles as they were had that tremendous challenge from the Lord to go and preach the gospel to every creature on this earth. And the Lord says, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the earth. And Peter talks about the precious blood of Jesus. That's in chapter one. You are not redeemed with silver and gold. Think of the temple. 
Think of that physical temple that, the, that was overlaid with that gold and the gold itself dominated the beauty of that temple. And they thought perhaps their redemption came at that temple. And he said, oh no, you're not redeemed with silver and gold. You were redeemed with the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. Where would you be right this very minute if Jesus were not precious to you? I'm always conscious of the importance of spirituality in the midst of a funeral. I cannot begin to imagine what anybody could say at the death of an atheist that would bring hope and comfort to the individuals that were there. I once had an occasion to uh, be involved in a, a funeral it was, going to, it was a person who was not a member of the church at all. But they asked me to be, be a part of it. And so I, I said, I'd, I'll be glad to do whatever you want me to do, trying to have, impact their life. So we're down, we were down, on, down at Lake Worth, down there on the beach, just uh, right, right where the beach, are, the beach is. Um, uh, 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 where, what was that? The, the, where you eat breakfast down there? What do you call that breakfast? Just right up from there, they're down on the Lake Worth. I think I almost said two J's, and that's the wrong one, but uh, that, that place that was there. And so it's time for the funeral. The funeral's over, and I've said everything I'm going to say. And let me tell you what gives hope. I sat there in absolute amazement as each of them opened up a little jar, took the lid off the jar, put a piece of plastic right down inside the jar, and then held it up and blew bubbles out into the ocean. Hope? hopelessness. I know there must be some symbolism in that, that that I cannot begin to imagine. But you think about that and the preciousness we have in the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. But look again, he says in verse 6, He who believes on Him will by no means be put to shame. Ever been on a losing team? When they used to pick the, uh, uh, the teams and, uh, you know, pick sides, were you the last one chosen? And did you play right field? You know, those of you who play baseball know that none of the balls come out into right field. You understand how, you know, that's the place you put the nobodies. Always on a losing team. Always. But that's not us. We're not the last ones chosen. And we are risking our souls. Think of how many hours you've already spent in this building. Think of over the 20 years that this building's been here. How many, how many hours? Three or four hours every week times 50 weeks times 20 years? How much of your life have you invested driving to this building? Not just for those weekly three or four, uh, four uh, uh, three and four, depending our classes, two classes and two worship services, you drive to the building. Think of how much time you spent doing that. And then think of the fact if Jesus is really not the cornerstone, if He's not the capstone that holds this holy temple together, what a waste of time. And so Peter says, you're not wasting your time. This is the Holy Spirit of God who tells Peter to write this. We ought to understand that when holy men spake as they were moved by the Spirit of God, it was the Holy Spirit, deity, that wanted every one of us to know that if we believe on Him, the chief cornerstone, verse 6, we will by no means be put to shame. And those who've laughed at you because of the de devotion that you've had to the Lord, and those who've mocked at you because of some spiritual value that you have, you need to understand, Judgment Day will be a day of vindication. When those who are laughing at you for bowing your knees willingly to Jesus in this life to bring about eternal salvation, will bow their knees on that day 
The Bible says we should bow them now, and the Bible says every knee will bow, but it'll be too late for them. You will not be put put to shame. For every time you've had to stand up for right and felt like you're on the outside, you'll not be put to shame. What about the wicked? What, what's their view of that? It's in this passage. What about the unbeliever? What is that cornerstone to them? He is rejected. He's precious to those, but to those who are disobedient, verse says, verse 7 says, the stone that they rejected. They've rejected Jesus. Can you imagine what it would be like on the day of judgment to be Pontius Pilate on the day of judgment? To have known everything that he knew about Jesus. Can you imagine what it would have been like to those individuals who, who heard Jesus and were convicted by what he said, knew what he said was absolutely right, and they chose, they willingly chose to disobey God. What about those individuals? Uh, John chapter 12 uh, says they would not confess him lest they be put out of the synagogue. Imagine that. They believed on him. They knew he was the son of God, but they were so wrapped up in, in, in a religion that was not the religion God wanted them to have. He wanted them to leave that religion and come to Jesus Christ. They would not confess him. Why? I've got too many friends down there in that synagogue. Imagine that day. That stone that they rejected, they will see him as the chief cornerstone. And he's a stumbling block to them. He's a stumbling block. Be a whole lot better not never to have known that Jesus lived than to have consciously been forced because you knew that there was, that Jesus was, had lived and Jesus wanted your life and yet were forced to make a decision and to say, I decide not to be a Christian. I wish in preaching, I wish you could forever remove from anybody's mind, well, if I were to die, I'd be lost. That's not the true picture. You are lost right this minute. And that's the reality. You'll not be more lost the day you die than, the, than you are lost right now. You'll not be more separated from God when you die than, you, than you're separated from God right now. It is not, I will be lost. No, I am saved, present tense, or I am lost, present tense. But I've got to make a decision about Him. And seeing the rock, seeing that stone, I've got to make a decision about it. And he, instead of being the avenue, becomes offensive to me, and I stumble over him. There is a tradition, and it sounds somewhat like a preacher's story, and so I don't want to say it's, it's, it's a true tradition. Preachers have a way of making up stories just to enhance their lesson, and I, I try not to give many of them. Uh, but there's a tradition that said when they built Solomon's temple, those stones that were there when Solomon built the temple were not, were not just cut out of the mountains there at Jerusalem. They were not cut out of the mountains just right around the, the holy city. They were cut out of a mountain miles and miles away from, the, uh, from Jerusalem. And the Bible does indicate that, by the way. And the Bible said when they brought all of those stones together, they fit the stones together and there was not the sound of one chisel shaping any one of those stones because it had been cut wrong. That's true. That's what the Bible says. The tradition says that when all of those stones arrived, they, put, they tried to put the stones in the proper place and there was one stone that they couldn't figure out where it was. So they just, they just cast it aside. And when it came time in the building of Solomon's temple for them to find the capstone, they could not find it. They had been stumbling over it again and again, only to finally arrive at that time in their life where they needed 
this stone that was elect, that was precious, that was trustworthy and rewarding, had become a stone of offense and a stumbling block wherever they walked. Whether that story is true or not, the point is obvious. Jesus is to us our Lord, our Savior, or He is our judge, and He is the one who pronounces sentence upon us. We must not let the story of the cross become so complacent in our hearts and in our lives that we hear the story and we fail to see the beauty of it. That song, tell me the old, old story, that line in that song, those that know it best seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. May that be what Jesus is to us. I remember vividly the very first time I ate the Lord's Supper. I remember my emotions the very first Sunday after I was baptized in eating the Lord's Supper. And I try to remember that and to bring it to mind, not every time I eat the Lord's Supper, but to bring it to my mind again and again, lest the preciousness that I felt that day about Christ dying for me become complacent, a place of complacency of my heart. Jesus is elect, precious, trustworthy. Or He is that which is a, an occasion of stumbling and an offense to us and he is, he is that individual that I reject. Have you rejected Jesus tonight? There's a plan of salvation that is for you. You know the steps if you, if you come to our services much at all, but this may be the first time you've ever heard of these steps of salvation. The cornerstone lived on this earth, and you've got to believe with all of your heart that He is the Son of God, he who disbelieves, he does, does not believe, shall be condemned, Mark 16, 16 says. You've got to repent. Luke chapter 13, verse 3 says, except you repent, you'll perish. You've got to confess, Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that you believe Jesus is the Son of God, and you've got to be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you haven't done that, you need to do it, not because someday you'll be lost if you were to die, you need to do that tonight because you are lost. Don't let Jesus be that stumbling block. Let Him be the Savior that holds not just the church together, but He holds all of your life together. If you need to respond to the invitation, do so right now. As together we stand and sing. Will you come?